As the 16th century ended and the 17th began, here in Catholic Rome there was a feeling of jubilation, a sense of rebirth. Pope Paul V, in the year of our Lord 1612, has brought water 35 miles from the healthiest springs in Bracciano through new and restored aqueducts. What better way to signal the revival of the ancient grandeur of Rome than to restore its renowned system for bringing water from the distant mountains to the city streets? Pope Paul's new water supply, the Aqua Paola, or Paul's water, as it was called in his honor, was soon rushing out into the daylight from splendid fountains all around the city. The finest of these fountains was designed by the great sculptor and architect Gian Lorenzo Bernini. It was built in the Piazza Navona, which stood on the foundations of an ancient stadium, a material expression of the idea of eternal Rome. The city had survived a hundred years of political and religious turmoil, of war and destruction. Despite the invasions of various European monarchs who'd attempted to conquer the city on the pretext of defending it, it had preserved its independence. And most important, the Catholic Church had survived the rise of Protestantism and its challenge to the authority of Rome. And it was now in the midst of a most extraordinary period of expansion as European colonization and exploration took its influence to the farthest corners of the earth. This Roman Catholic renewal, which historians call the Counter-Reformation, was given added purpose and vigor by a remarkable group of visionaries. The Spanish mystic and philosopher Teresa of Avila insisted that everyone could experience intense and personal knowledge of God. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit teaching order, inspired his followers to go out to work with spiritual fervor in the real world. And the missionary Francis Xavier carried to distant India and Japan the message of the Roman Church. To fulfill the needs of the resurgent church, artists and architects from all over Europe flocked into Rome. They came to design and ornament the churches that were built in the explosion of activity inspired by the Counter-Reformation. The church reformers called for works of art and architecture that would bring the people into the churches, inspire faith and religious commitment. An artistic revival resulted and a new style. It was an exuberant style, reflecting the optimism and assertiveness of the 17th century church. This style is known as the Baroque. The fresco on the ceiling above our heads was painted by Pietro da Cortona in the 1630s. It decorates the reception hall of the Barberini Palace in Rome, the family home of Pope Urban VIII, a great patron of the arts. To the modern sensibility, molded by the notion that less is more, it may seem merely decorative and probably confusing. But a careful look at this work, done at the height of the Baroque period, reveals a well thought out design based on a program or written plan. When Urban looked up at his ceiling, he saw the figure of divine providence stretch her arms to a chorus of maidens who carry the emblem of his family, the Barberini bees. They carry the bees up to the crossed keys of St. Peter, the symbol of the papacy, and to the papal crown. The painting is meant to be read. It tells us that Pope Urban VIII is a great and worthy man, but it also tells us that the ideals of the classical world have been subordinated to the values of triumphant Christianity. Every figure in this swirling panorama has meaning. The scenes painted around the sides of the ceiling, for instance, tell stories extolling the Pope's virtues. His unyielding battle against heresy is here symbolized by Athena destroying insolence and pride in the shape of the giants. 
Here his piety conquers lust and intemperance, represented by the satyrs. Like the artists of the Renaissance, Cortona uses the vocabulary of classical antiquity, but he draws his figures naturalistically with lifelike vigor and sensuality. The architectural elements are not real, but are painted as if they were. They blur the distinction between real and illusory space, at the same time suggesting hidden depths out of which the painted figures seem to tumble. Overlapping layers of light and dark create a sensation of breathtaking movement. In this one ceiling, we have all the elements of the high Baroque style. A clearly defined program, a dynamic and dramatic tension between naturalism and classicism, between illusion and reality, between light and dark, and always movement. Why were Baroque artists concerned with illusion and reality, with light and dark, with movement, time and space? Before the 16th century, the Earth was believed to be the unmoving center of the universe, about which sun, stars and planets all revolved. The existence of human beings and their salvation was the purpose of the universe. In 1543, the astronomer Copernicus published his work on the revolutions of heavenly bodies. His revelation that the Earth moved around the sun challenged people's perceptions of themselves. The title page of Galileo's book on the solar system shows Copernicus demonstrating to the revered ancient philosophers Aristotle and Ptolemy that their view had been wrong. The Earth was just one of many celestial bodies, all of which obeyed the same impartial laws. At about the same time that Europeans learned that the Earth was not the center of the universe, the discovery of the Americas and the exploration of the Far East revealed that Europe was not the center of the world. In this time of spiritual crisis, provoked by the explosion of knowledge, artists sought new ways of seeing and understanding.